Officer down! I repeat, officer down! Welcome back to 1033. This is your host, Nathan Kapler. A podcast created for a first responder by a first responder. If you are not a first responder, you still are welcome. This podcast is aimed directly at trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is complex and often misunderstood. Our brave men and women who serve our communities often end up with behavioral and psychological issues as a result of experienced trauma from their careers. My goal is to share what I know my personal experience with PTSD as a retired police officer, and continue to advocate for mental health while providing support to those still in their careers. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical help, and I strongly suggest if you are in fact suffering, you seek out professional medical advice. Please join me on this episode as I continue to expose the reality of PTSD challenges. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to 1033. Today I am joined by Paulette Bro. Paulette Bro joins us from Ontario. I am incredibly excited to connect with you today, Paulette, because it is something that has been brewing now for quite some time. We've been connected, we've been talking, and as soon as I connected with you, I heard a little bit about your story. Your story goes into 30 years of experience with the Mounties. You've had a phenomenal career out in Ontario. You've done so much for your community, so much for the world to try and make it a better place. And unfortunately, you saw the impacts of police work, police work or being a first responder. And you now are retired. You retired in 2017 and you are now on a much different path. You are trying to heal from all of those years of police work. Now, before we dive into that world or that topic, I want to thank you for your service and your sacrifice. And I want to just say, how are you doing today? You know what, Minnie? I'm doing better than I've been for quite a while now. I'm on a really great path. I'm on the road to recovery and it feels really good. It's important to recognize when we become unwell from our service life and post-traumatic comes creeping in, post-traumatic stress, and what we need to do now to get better. So before we dive into how you've gotten to just this important chapter in your life, how does your story start? Well, well, actually, my story started when I joined back in 1987. Uh, I was from New Brunswick, from born and raised to see the Mounties and the, pl- and the police cars driving by. Uh, my dad was an auxiliary member and my mom was a matron, so looked after the female prisoners. So I got a really great chance when I was young to n- know the Mounties, meet the Mounties, and see what kind of work that they did, which was general duty. And that's what I wanted. Uh, so uh, I applied when, in 1985. Uh, was told I'd get in within uh, three months, and then they found out I wasn't bilingual, and then I had to wait a little while. So finally, in 1987, I got the call to go. They called me on a Wednesday. I got sworn in on a Friday, and by Saturday, I was in Regina, Saskatchewan. And uh, it, I was glad that they didn't really give me a whole lot of time to think about it. Be- I, I had waited two years. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to go. So it was a dream come true for me. I was just so excited. It was like pinching myself. I couldn't believe my dream had finally come true, that I was going to become a Mountie. Exciting times. Oh, my God. It, it really was. It was a, this, it's a, something I always knew I wanted to be since I was about 14 years old. I remember going to a fair where the uh, police had set up a, a recruiting booth. And at the time, the fellow told me that I wasn't tall enough to join. Back then, when they still had the height and weight requirements, I was one inch too short. I was only five foot two. So, did you stand on your tippy toes? I did. I even did that when I joined. I was still nervous about the whole thing. And the fellow laughed at me and said, You don't have to be on your tippy toes anymore. And I was just, he caught me, but I was just so excited. I wanted to make sure I got in. The, uh, the drive to get in when we, when we see things. Uh, in the Mountie experiences that we have in our life. And I had a very similar experience too, growing up in a small town. So I got to experience what Mounties were really like in a small town. And I absolutely love them. Amazing men and women who serve the community. And I couldn't think of a better platform in life to go and have a career uh, as a first responder or a police officer. 
Now there's a much darker side to policing and that's kind of why we're here talking about it. Uh, what did you do before being a police officer? Did you do anything? Were you exposed to any trauma or anything like that? Uh, a little bit when I was younger as a child. I had been unfortunately molested by a family member. So that was very traumatic and something that, uh, you know, I eventually was able to overcome and, and continue on with my life. So there was a little bit of trauma when I was a young girl. The really important aspect, too, of talking about our childhood experiences is it definitely impacts our post-traumatic stress later on in life when we get it. And I'm actually really happy you brought this up and you seem to be at peace with it, uh, it being a part of your story, this sexual abuse that happened when you were a very young child. Um, And we can dive into childhood trauma a little bit later too in the conversation because it really does actually hold a very big space in the world of PTSD and how we now actually can heal. And I'm sure that this actually was something that you had to heal from later on in life, probably when you collapsed and fell down from PTSD. Because when we do, we actually have to go back to our childhood first and start to heal ourselves there and then come back into the trauma that we re-experience later on in life as an adult and start to deal with the PTSD that we may get from service life. Uh, So I wanted to say, hey, you know what, thank you for sharing that. Um, That alone is an incredible amount of vulnerability and the courage it takes even just for that to come out. I I applaud you because oddly enough, this happens so frequently. Yeah. So frequently with people and there is so much shame and guilt and all of these negative emotions built around these incidents that happen in our lives with our childhood that impact us significantly later on in life. And once you can get to a point where you can speak about it openly, I truly applaud you for that because you get to break free of all of that stuff. Yes. And and it took time. Like, luckily I was very, uh, I was blessed that my mom was a listener and, and listened to me when I told her about my experiences Uh, the one promise we made to each other is that we wouldn't tell my father because we were afraid he would uh, do something to harm the person that was involved. So, but I was blessed that my mom was there for me. Absolutely. You have to have at least one person in your life. You can tell these things too, right? And that's just how it goes in life. Now for you, we'll come back to this a little bit later, if that's okay, Paulette. Um, Sure. Your life with the Mounties, 1987, you get in. Where do things go for you from that point on? Well, of course, I always, and the reason why I joined the Mounties was to do general duty policing. Um, I guess my big sh- shock and devastation the first was uh, when I found out I was going to O Division. I had no idea that uh, Ontario and Quebec, that I now know today, didn't do uh, contract policing because that's what I joined for. So that was my first real wake-up call to the RCMP. I was like, what? This isn't what I signed up for. Uh, I, I applied to three provinces and uh, unfortunately got O Division. And uh, that was my first wake-up call when I arrived. And uh, my coaching officer, I says, okay, what do I do? Like, I got my uniform ready. He says, we don't wear a uniform here. I said, well, what do you mean you don't wear a uniform? We're Mounties, aren't we? He said, yeah, but we don't wear it here. So that was my first introduction to uh, O Division and uh, federal policing, I guess. How was it for you to leave home? You know, in, in I reflected on that quite a bit near the end of training and the two weeks that I was home before I left. Um, I knew I probably knew I would never go back home because uh, I knew the Mounties could I could get transferred a lot throughout Canada. But uh, when I was told I couldn't go back to my home province, uh, I just uh, put it in my mind that this was, I was saying goodbye to my family because uh, I would be going out to Ontario and, you know, I would see them, I guess, on holidays. And if they came to visit or I went back to visit them, but I knew that I was leaving home for good. How did you process that as well, Paulette? Was there any kind of grieving process that you had to go through in order to get through some of the challenges of leaving home? Certainly there was. Um, I had left home uh, earlier to go to work. In New Brunswick, there wasn't a lot of work, so you had to travel to find work. So I'd left home when I was, uh, I think, 18 years old. So I'd already left home once, so that kind of helped a little bit. But I think it, it was almost like a grieving process. It was almost like, it's not that you're, 
no one's died, but it's almost like you're saying goodbye for the last time. It's it's because you never know when you're going to see them again. It's and and I was going to a province that I knew no one. I I had no person in the world that I knew in the province of Ontario. So I was on my own and had to make the best I could of it. I don't mean to draw in too much of my own personal experience, but very similar to you. And I think a lot of Mounties go through this. We're very young. When we get in, we end up leaving our home province, our family structure, and we can then get shipped off to a place where we're now working and we maybe don't have that support structure anymore. And we maybe have those feelings of, you know, how do we grieve uh, a part of this loss of this huge transition that we're going through, the change, the immense amount of change that happens in depot. And then and being thrust into a community with no family, no support structure, and now dealing with some of this uh, almost loss and lack of support and some of these feelings of being alone. Was that something that you experienced as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can remember uh, I used to volunteer to work extra hours because what was it going to do was sit alone in a hotel room all by myself or sit in an apartment with no one to talk to? Like, I mean... I started off with nothing, like, what was I going to do? So all I did was throw myself into work to try to deal with that loneliness and and the grieving process. I just worked more and worked harder. My story, very, very similar. And I know many other people out there are going to have this aspect of the story that they may be trying to now look at and go, okay, I did go through all of these very legitimate feelings. Uh, they may be at different parts of their career and they may be now starting to experience PTSD. But for many of, many of us, our stories actually start this way. Absolutely. Like you say, it's, it's, it's almost like you're going to your own funeral because you know you're saying goodbye to everybody. I hate to put it in that for, that phrase, but that's what it felt like. It felt like I was saying goodbye for the last time. And even though I knew I would see them again, that, that, that wasn't off the table, but it just felt like you were saying goodbye to the life that you used to know. That life was now over and you were moving on to a new life. Yeah, if we take this even a step further too, I mean, we're definitely saying goodbye to the person that we are and we're becoming someone different because we do have to become someone different now in a community now that we're serving. And the training definitely does start to change you as a person, as an individual. So before we dive into maybe that component of this this space that we're holding right now is connection, what kind of person were you before going into depot? Oh, very outgoing, gargarious you know, uh, always smiling, you know, cups always running over. Like I was just a very happy, go lucky person. Uh, and I remember a good friend of mine told me, he says, Paulette, don't join the RCMP. And I said, why? He said, you're just too nice a person. I was surprised by that because he was in the military and he had had a, a, a long, extensive career in the military. But that's those were his words of wisdom to me before I joined the Mounties. Very interesting question. And I want to approach this one very cautiously because we actually have a mutual friend who will probably listen to this. And how how do you now approach people that are wanting to get into policing that maybe possess the same behavioral traits that you did as a person before becoming a Mountie? And I think that's very important. The, I try not to take away somebody's dream. Like I had the dream, like you had the dream. We loved the idea of becoming Mounties. We wanted to go in and help, but I think I try to expose them to the realities of policing by sharing a little bit of my story with the PTSD, um, I ended up writing a book and I I will let people read the book and say, once you're finished reading the book, then we're going to have a heart to heart conversation because I think they need to see uh, what it was really like. And it's easier sometimes for me to let people read about it than it is to talk about it because then you get emotional. I completely agree. And I completely agree with you on the pr- the approach of how do we handle someone who looks to us for wisdom on what they should do with their life. You don't want to stop people in pursuing their dreams, but you also want to have a very real conversation about the impacts of first responder work. And this, this goes for whatever you get into, whether it's policing, firefighter, uh, any kind of those crucial roles in society. These people 
are amazing individuals, but there is a cost to service. That's why we say thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. The person that you were before going into depot evidently changed. Did that change in depot or did that start to change when you were in Ontario? I think I made it through depot pretty much with a big smile on my face because I just couldn't believe the dream was coming true. Now, it didn't take, I think probably the bubble burst a little bit in depot because they didn't hire the type of people I thought they were going to hire. I thought that we were going to have a high quality, that everybody that went to depot went there with the same heart and and love for the RCMP that I did. But there were people that were there because they couldn't get a job in their chosen occupation. The RCMP were hiring, you know, the door of opportunity opened. But not everybody was there for the same reason I was there. And I found that a little bit disappointing. We had a running joke of Canada's finest in our troop. And I'm sure that joke was the same as as for you with your troop. You only had Canada's finest in your troop. And that's not to say, like, I don't look at these these people that got in that maybe my expectations of them, that they should have been a little bit more polished or somebody else. I was, I tried to be very good in depot and outside as well while I was working is to not hold judgment over others because it's really out of your control who gets hired by the Mounties. But I do agree with you. You do kind of go through this wake up call, I think in depot where you just kind of go, hmm, interesting, (laughs) right? Because you've made so much of a sacrifice already to get to where you're at in life, right? Like you may have uh, withheld or stood back from certain personal relationships while growing up and you may have lived a much different life. And then when someone comes in and says, oh, I, I had people that, you know, were into drugs and I was around that all the time, right? And that was an era too where for you, when you got in, it was very black and white in regards to drug use. You weren't allowed to use it at all. Right. So you there, it was, life was very black and white for you. You had to live that way in order to get in. Yep, exactly. And knowing that you were under the, you know, the microscope, because you knew that they were going to do a very intensive background investigation into you and those things would come out. So you're right. You, you choose the friends that you want to hang around with. You choose the relationships you want to get into. You're very careful and cautious about everything you do because you know that could come back to bite you if you're not careful in the steps and the relationships that you take. It's a really interesting time too right now for the Mounties. I just heard that they dropped their uh, their testing requirements, like their initial, um, I can't even remember, a cognitive test or whatever they call it, the R, I can't even remember what it's called. Um, but they've dropped that and they've reduced all of these standards all over the place because we all know right now the Mounties are really struggling with not only one, uh, retaining good people, but hiring good people as well. So they've had to unfortunately drop their standards. I think their wages are slowly catching up, but that might be up for a bit of debate. Uh, And I mean, for when I got in, I want to say I was kind of getting in at the tail end of almost the generational threshold that you would have got in under as well. Like they still viewed my generation coming in. You had to be very black and white. You either fit the role or you didn't. Now the RCMP is changing their ways. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I have no idea. I really don't have an opinion on this. I I understand they need to change and I think that's good. Um, but you and I came in at a totally different time. And I mean, that's just kind of a side story we're, do- we're diving into that maybe doesn't even need to really get into too, too far. But yeah. You get in, you're expecting that you're going to jump in, you're going to do general duty, you go to Ontario, and you quickly realize that you signed up for a much different experience, or at least you were thrust into a different environment altogether. What did you end up doing in the beginning? And can you paint a picture of what some of those initial years of service life looked like? Certainly. When I first joined and got to Niagara, I was posted to Niagara Detachment, and a lot of people in Depot said, who do you know, and how did you get Niagara Detachment? Well, I I didn't really know much or anybody, so uh, I I guess I was considered that I got a very good posting right out of Depot. Um, When I first got there, my trainer was in what they called the Federal Enforcement Section at the time, and so, uh, you know, when you do your six months of uh, recruit field training, you do uh, a few weeks in each f- in each federal unit to get a taste of it. 
uh, when I got there, um, unfortunately, my trainer's wife was uh, very pregnant and went off. He went off on uh, leave not shortly after I res- I got there because of his wife's uh, had given birth to their first son. So I was a little bit left on my own. If some, if anything else, I was almost treated like a secretary. I was the only woman at the detachment. So I was the second ever female to ever go to Niagara detachment. And the first one quit. Apparently she couldn't handle the uh, sense of humor that some of the fellas had and uh, unfortunately didn't stay and quit. So, you know, many years later, here I am, and I'm the only female. At first they treated me with uh, kids gloves. They basically would say a swear word and then, oh, I'm sorry, Paulette. Or they'd hold the door open for me, which was very lovely. But eventually they got used to me and started to, uh, you know, ease the way they were acting around me and started to be more like themselves. I think things for me really changed when I went and did my rotation in the drug unit. There they said, basically, you're a girl. I said, sure am. Well, we want you to go out on the street and buy drugs. I had no idea what I was doing. I was the only girl in my troop of 30 that had never seen a marijuana plant. Now they're asking me to go out and buy it. So I did the best I could uh, with, like I mean, I had three months service in the field, in 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 my recruit field trading service, and uh, they sent me out to go and buy drugs. So that was an aha moment for me, and that's when life changed because eventually I was able to successfully buy drugs, and once I bought them, it was like taking candy from a baby. Back in the, you got to understand that back in 1987, there was a kind of like a rumor going around in Canada that basically if someone asked you if you were a police officer, you had to tell the truth. If you lied, you couldn't arrest them. Now that was not the case in Canada, but apparently it was so it was true in the United States. But that rumor entered into Canada and when people asked me, hey, are you a cop? I'd say no. And they they'd sell me drugs because they believed that law was true in Canada. We're heavily influenced by the Americans. I don't know how many times I would sit down with somebody in the interview and I'd be just start talking to them about a crime that they had committed. And they would literally tell me, I plead the fifth. And the first time I heard this, I was like, what are you saying? <laughs> what, what do you actually mean right now? I plead the fifth. And I'm like, oh, you're talking about the American TV shows that you watch. And I was like, no, it doesn't work that way up here. <laughs> So interesting. I didn't know, actually know that, um, that there is this people can ask you this question. And back then there was this expectation that you tell them whether you're a cop or not, or you're undercover. So for you, was there any kind of training or any kind of unit or any kind of experience that was given to you prior to being, I guess, pushed out the door to go and buy drugs? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, and it was funny because the the information I was given from one of the corporals when I went out, and I'll tell you this story, it was one of my, it was, I think it was the first time I ever bought drugs. He basically told me to go out and buy a dime bag. Of course, I didn't know what a dime bag was, but okay, I'll buy a dime bag. So he gave me $100. I said, well, how much is a dime bag? He said, well, you should be able to get it for 100 bucks. That's what I'm giving you. Okay. So I go and I, make, I de- meet with this fellow. He agrees to sell me, uh, asked for a dime bag. He agrees to sell it to me. So he goes and gets it. He comes back he, and he says, that'll be $300. I went, what? $300? Uh, how much can I get for 100 Oh, well, I can get you this much for 100 bucks. So even the corporal who was guiding me was giving me wrong information. He was out of date with what the street prices were at that time, too. So... That was the fellow I relied on, and the information he was giving me was outdated. I remember when I joined, and there's an underlying theme here. I remember when I joined, I too was thrust into these different situations that I definitely wasn't ready for. Uh, And again, this is very common with the Mounties. And I'm not saying this to paint the Mounties with a bad brush and say, you know, poor you, you know, or say as an employer to the RCMP, you know, they've got to do a better job. But there are so many times as Mounties when we first get in that, and I think this, this happens too, this happened a lot for me. If I wasn't completely comfortable with something, a situation, like if I didn't truly understand it, a lot of times I stayed silent. 
because when I first got in, I didn't fully feel ready to ask these men and women that were Mounties and I was the new Mountie the questions that we need the answers to. And that can be a very real kind of part of when we first get in some of the issues that we may experience, I think, is not one, be not being provided with the right information to do the job, but also not having the ability to to ask the right questions either. Because you do, you look up to your fellow men and women when you get in, you really respect them. And I think that needs to shift. Or if you're that kind of person, you at least need to have some awareness into that. Now, for you going through this experience, I'm not going to say this is how you went through it, um, but obviously you went through a lot of these somewhat chaotic events. Where does where does some of the trauma start to come creeping in at? What what point of the story? Um, I think after I was doing undercover work for, I think I was doing it for about 18 months when the RCMP actually ordered me to stop. I was ma- I was buying so much drugs that basically the organization said you're a liability to our service because you're not trained, and they, I was literally ordered by the commanding officer of the division to buy no more narcotics. That was it. I was cut off. Their um, their solution to that was sending me on the undercover course. So at 18 months service, I was on the undercover course. You can't get on the undercover course until you have at least two years of drug experience. So I broke all the rules from the get-go, you know, f- for allowing me to buy drugs untrained, you know, too junior in service, no formal training. Uh, so the solution was go to go to the undercover course, which I did. What I didn't realize at the time is they had already had me lined up for my first uh, undercover job even before I left. So I did the course, successfully passed the course, and I was home for maybe two weeks after the course before I went off and did my first uh, three-month undercover job. Now, there's obviously two things that are happening probably around this time. There's one where you are starting to, I don't know if you're experiencing like an overinflated ego because you're doing the good work. Or if you're truly seeing the cost of them using you the way they want to use you for their own, their own gain, their own, I don't even know how to say it, but what, what were you experiencing in that moment? I was basically on a, on a rush, on a high. I couldn't believe anyone would sell me drugs. And the, the, the way I looked at it was I was being accepted by the guys in the drug unit. I was getting accepted where, where uh, other people that came to the detachment had to really struggle and got to do some really crappy jobs. I was getting some sweet, you know, I was bypassing some of the dirtier jobs or not so good jobs because I was doing so good buying the drugs. I was making the unit look very, very good. So it, I was being treated very well and was being accepted. Uh, and that to me was well worth whatever risk I was taking. The slippery slope. Yes. Very slippery slope. But I didn't know it at the time. I was just so happy to be accepted as a, as a member. Because back then, you have to understand, in the 80s, we were still considered female members. We weren't members of the RCMP. And that's all I ever wanted to be was a member. I didn't want to have to be labeled as a female member. Yeah, you know what I mean by slippery slope. Mm-hmm. Um, so for you, now that you're, you're going about your career this way, uh, and I think you had touched on something very critical, you're more or less alone, uh, and you're not really engaged with maybe the family unit as you once were, you're working a lot, you're taking on a lot of overtime. When did you start to notice, I guess, a real shift in you or your mood? I kind of knew after about my first undercover job that I had done, I knew that I was starting to feel burnt out. I had put in a lot of time, a lot of hours. And what I did was a friend of mine, I said, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Pretend I've got a rope tied around my waist. I'm going to give you the other end. And the minute you see me start to change, please pull on the rope. So I'd put this lifeline out to someone I trusted. The problem was I went from undercover job to undercover job to undercover job. 
by the time things had really started to change for me, it was too late for her to pull on the rope. I was already far down the slope before anybody knew it. And by that point, I was such a good little actress because I'd done so much undercover work that I would come back and fool everybody with the big smile and the happy demeanor. But when I was home, I was crying. I was upset. I was struggling. I was lonely. I didn't have anyone to talk to. But at work, I was happy-go-lucky Paulette. So I just hit it very, very well. We get very good at wearing masks. Very good. And, and I think because I was away so much, people didn't realize the, the mask that I was wearing. As long as I acted the same as I was before I left, they just assumed that everything was okay. One of the problems is, is that after, the, after every undercover job, you're supposed to go see the fourth psychologist and be assessed to whether or not you're ready to do another undercover job. Even the fourth psychologist wasn't astute enough to understand what was going on and to realize that there was a problem. How do you know there's a problem with a person when you only see them once every year or two? Well, and the other part of it too, like I know even from my own journey is I, I had a very different career path uh, from you, but very similar story to I can recognize even in my own journey where I started to wear the masks and kind of present to the world as a much different individual in order to hide the pain that I was going through. And I think that's a very kind of crucial role to understand where we're at in our service life, because that's kind of where things are starting to shift, right? And you made a really good analogy of telling a friend like, hey, I'm going to tie this rope around me, give it a tug when things start to get out of control. Now, unfortunately, there's no blame to the friend. She wasn't able to be there. But you also had this perfect lifestyle at the time where you're always out doing all of these different undercover gigs, and you're just slowly changing over time. And she probably didn't even really necessarily even see the change. And when she does, see you and you come back you present yourself as someone much different very happy and you hide everything very very well now the psychologist and this is something i found too even in my own experiences it took me a long time to be able to really be able to talk about the pain and suffering that i had within because i had put on so many different masks over the years and hid from so many of my problems from first responder work that it really was i was a master at evading everything do you agree with that for yourself? Absolutely. I would go into the psychologist and I'd be outside and I'd be nervous. My hands would be cold and sweaty because I wanted to make sure that when I left the room, I was ready to go back and do more undercover work. It almost became an addiction for me. I was so good and so the adrenaline high of going in there and fooling everybody and getting drugs and putting them in my pocket and getting ready to put someone in jail was a rush it was a high of its own so for you what do you think and again my story is very different to, from yours because i went through a general duty phase where i had to do the gd work and i saw the trauma and i think that's where some of my ptsd comes from now that you're reflecting back to your experience where do you think some of your ptsd came from the way that undercover operators are I want to say thought of um, some of the guys thought that if you were an undercover female officer, that you must be a little loose, easy to a little bit easy looking for love, looking for the wrong kind of attention from men. And I found that I was getting hit on not only by the bad guys, which it happens, but also sometimes from my own men because they thought, well, if you're a female and you love going out to bars and you love drinking and you seem to have this lifestyle of an undercover operator, that must be you in real life too. And yet it was the furthest from the truth. I was an athlete. I loved sports. I loved playing sports. That was my thing, going to the gym. Uh, but the undercover life, people just assumed you must be what you are. You portray yourself to be this way. You must be this way. How did you handle that? It was difficult. Um, at, at first, I, I tried really hard not to take on any of the advances of the co-workers um, because that's not what I was there for. That's not what I was looking for. I wanted to get in, do a good job, and get out again. Um, so it, it was a bit of a challenge to try to 
A, these are the people that are looking after you, that are supposed to look after your health, your well-being, and so on. And, and you felt troubled that they didn't necessarily have your best intentions at heart. They were looking for something else, too, from you and not something you were willing to provide. I can pick up on how intense this was for you. It, it was a very troubling time for me. Um, everything that I had done from, from zero years of service till, till about seven years was all basically, my whole life was just undercover work. I didn't have a chance to become a strong investigator till after my undercover work was done because I was used and abused in that role. And I remember going to another job and the same thing happened. And the cover men said, well, you're pretty easy going, you're easy you know, and at the end of the shift, when everybody was supposed to go home, two of the guys come back and knock on the door. I was working with another female op operator, and they basically assumed they were going to get lucky that night. I mean, that is not a situation anybody wants to be put into. No. So in the, the, the reality of this is you make the sacrifices in your life to become the person that you believe that you should be in order to become a police officer. You get into that role and then you leave your family and the RCMP is notoriously bad at this. They always say, this is your new family. Yeah. Right? So you go into this new relationship as a young person or an old person or whatever the case is, but you're literally told the RCMP is your family. Now, whether you want to debate whether that's healthy or not, I mean, that's totally irrelevant. Your expectation when you get in, because I lived this too, was that they were going to have your back. They were going to be your support system. And you too, much like many of us have experienced a very different story. They maybe weren't your support system. They maybe wanted something else from you, or there were some clear boundaries that were crossed. Mm -hmm. Abs absolutely. And like you say, the I considered my Niagara people to be my family, uh, but I also looked at it, not right away, but eventually it took time, Nate, for me to realize that like any family, there's no such thing as a TV family. We had our dysfunctional, uh, we were dysfunctional in our own ways. We had uh, our issues with certain members, issues, problems. I mean, we were... The RCMP family is like any normal family out there. We come with our issues, our problems, uh, and it didn't take me long in the roles that I was given to see that because the people I had to rely on and I was told to rely on, at times I felt like I couldn't. And I don't, yeah, and I got to be very, uh, I'm going to back up just a bit here. I try, and, I try to be very careful on the podcast not to paint the RCMP as this big bad wolf, right? And the only reason I bring this up is not to say the RCMP is bad or these people are bad. These are just our experiences, right? But be damned if we can't talk about it now with the reflection that we have and at least give our story to people that might be in it right now because there's a lot of people that are going to listen to this. And a lot of people are going to sit there and go, oh, wow, you know what? I maybe need to hold some awareness into how I view the RCMP or the amount of balance that I have in my life or my relationships that I have at work. Well, and two, there was no such thing as a life home balance for me. It was all work, no life. I just gave it everything I had. And two, like I say, I think at the end of the day, if we would have had a little bit more open communication to understand for to know each other. I mean, you get there, you basically sit by yourself all day waiting to go to work. The guys show up around supper time and say, okay, this is the plan for the night. We're going to go out around nine o'clock. You're going to hit so many bars and then we'll see you again at two in the morning. We'll debrief and that's the end of it. But never was there time for you to develop that relationship with some of your coworkers as, as an undercover so that you could iron out those expectations and say, look, I'm here to do a job. That's all I'm here to do. You know, get to know me as a person so you'll know that I'm not the character that you think I am. But that we just didn't make time for that. It's like having a good briefing, debriefing on a on a call, on a GD call, right? How many times have we actually sat down after the call and debriefed it? I know for us it was over a beer. Okay, have a beer. Everybody good? Good. Go home. 
I mean, we didn't talk about things like that. So I think there's that lack of communication where you set the stage and you set the the parameters for what this is going to look like. Absolutely. I think even for myself, like I'm already getting wrapped up in, and I'm just going to segue into a different train of thought here, but I'm already getting wrapped up into this conversation so deeply with you, Paulette, that I know this is going to be long and I don't want it to be short because we really need to hold space for this conversation. You're absolutely crushing it. Like the amount of, of information you're bringing forward here uh, is phenomenal. So, and I'm just trying to go back to what we were just talking about here. When I was when I joined, there was a brief moment in my own service where I thought undercover was the answer for me. I really liked drug work, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, undercover would be a perfect fit. Uh, I've always been told I don't necessarily look like a cop or move like a cop. I probably did later on in life because of the issues I held from policing. Right? It was pretty easy to spot, but in the very beginning, I actually thought to myself, this would this would be kind of interesting. But I also had a immense amount of fear about getting in as an undercover cop because of what you just talked about, the character that you become. Mm -hmm. And I knew that a lot of people that get into undercover work, they become this character and they maybe don't ever come back. And they say it's a switch and it's not a switch. You're absolutely right, Nate. Um, I remember going back for probably one of the first times I went back home to see my parents And I remember the first thing I said when I walked through the door, and I'm a person that doesn't swear, but I remember surprising my mom. And the first words out of my mouth was, what the fuck's going on here? And I never speak like that. And my mom for years and years remembered that. And she, and she would mimic it and say it to me back again because she couldn't believe I'd said it, but you're right. You, there isn't always that easy on and off switch. And there were times when I couldn't shut it off. That's mom. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, even just to dive into that thought a little bit deeper, because some people probably listen to this and they'll say, okay, wait, what, what's really wrong with going home and saying that? But the person that you were would never have gone through those doors at home and entered into and started a conversation that way. So the immense shift that has happened from Paulette Bro to the person that you were then uh, is very significant. And that is what you are trying to highlight is that this person that you are now have become is very much different. Now, in that moment, did you recognize that you had become someone different? I think the re- Immediately after I said it, I regretted it because there's my mom and I saw the reaction on her face. And that was enough for me to know that, oops, I think I've just done something wrong. Uh, And that was my first probably aha moment that maybe things weren't going as well as I thought they were going. Because I think when someone you love makes that kind of a facial, you know, that look at you, you know, things are going good. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And just to take a pause here for a moment, just to kind of honor kind of what's going on. I mean, this is, this is, and this is why I said earlier on, this is mom. Yeah. Right. I don't know if mom is still around or, or if mom has passed on for you, but there are definitely certainly moments in my own career as you were telling the story about how you engaged with your family where even I can reflect on how I engaged with my family and my loved ones in my life and some of the pain that I had caused them because of where I was in my service life and that's how real it gets oh yeah I mean like you say the lady that I'd given the rope to wasn't wasn't able to pull it and I don't blame her for that but when your mom's pulling the rope and you didn't give it to her that's when, you know, things have really gone sideways. How how far into service life were you at this point, Paulette? Yeah, close to about five years of service. Yeah. And how did the how did this journey continue on from that point on? I'm assuming you didn't step forward from that place and, and start to dig into what's really going on here. How does the rest of the story go? Yeah, you're right. I basically, you know, tried to suck it up and say, come on, Paulette. Uh, things need to get better from here. But it was around five years service that uh, the a a serious event took place uh, that where I was a victim of a sexual assault uh, as a result of doing the work that I was doing. It. uh, It had a significant change in, in my life. 
are you comfortable to talk about this? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I I wrote about it. It was the best thing I ever did was get it out because I'd kept it quiet for such a long period of time. And once again, it's a matter of communicating and talking and getting these things out. It's when you keep it in that it destroys you. What's the name What's the name of your book? It's called Never at Ease. And I wrote it about these experiences, about the undercover work, about the way that I felt I was being treated. I wrote about the sexual assault. And I needed, that's how I actually told my family. That's how I told my friends. It was something that I felt very difficult to speak about. But, uh, and after going through and seeing a very good psychologist, I was able to finally start to write things down as much as it it took me over three years to even tell her that I had been a victim of sexual assault. Yes, it took a long, long time. And she she even asked me, do you trust me? Do you want to go to a different doctor? I said, no. I said, it just took me this long to get it out. And, and I eventually did. And then that's when the healing starts. Once you start getting some of these things out and, and dealing with them, the amount of guilt I felt, I blamed myself. I, here I am, a female police officer. These things shouldn't happen to us. But it did. It, it, um, but the shame. I mean, how do you go and tell your coworkers? How do you go and tell your friends? And they look at you. They put you up on a pedestal. Oh, you know, I've talked to I don't know how many kids during recruiting sessions where they said, do you think I can put a 250-pound guy in the car? And they all say, oh, yes, you can. You know, they have an assumption that we are super beings and we're not we're we're as liable and capable of, of getting hurt as as anybody else is and unfortunately that's what happened to me i ended up getting hurt and um, but i had to overcome that because if i didn't i would have never continued in the job i had to suck it up get on with life and move forward because i knew that this was a this was one of the times where I considered not staying in the RCMP. I want to commend you for what you endured and somehow being able to push through what had happened because I know the depth of the pain that was there as you grappled with the shame and the guilt and all of these very difficult things, but a female at that time trying to hold it all together and portray this image. The, the assault, the sexual assault that took place, and the very unfortunate part, and we haven't even crossed this bridge yet, but a lot of times women experience this internally with the Mounties. And I don't know if that's your experience, and I don't know how far I want to push this conversation because of the pain that it can unlock for you, mm. but sharing kind of how problematic this, this is in the culture of policing is very prevalent. I don't know if it's still going on today, but when I joined, it was still happening then. Yeah. I mean, we've gone through the Merlo Davidson lawsuit. We've had the report from the judge uh, it was eye-opening, to say the least. Um, you know, the statistics are there, and they were devastating. I was one of those statistics. But I didn't want to become a statistic where I th threw in the towel and went home. One of the things that I, I think I want to go back on, Nate, is when we talked about how I felt about leaving home, that really had an impact on me after this sexual assault because I always believed that I couldn't go back home. I believe that this was the path that I was on and that I had to continue on this path. Going home would, would mean to me to be a complete and utter failure, and I just couldn't do that. So I chose to do everything in my power to keep going forward because I didn't want to be that failure. I, I, I'm i almost shocked at how much emotion I'm just feeling right now in this moment, and that's where that's why I'm kind of at a loss for words right now. and. Again, this just comes into the heaviness of the conversation that's happening right now. A lot of us that go through these things in life, go through them quietly at first. 
we don't know how to talk about this. We don't know how to bring it forward. And in that moment, you didn't know how to bring any of this forward. You didn't know how to go home. You didn't know how to leave the organization that hurt you as a result of this sexual assault. There was a clear violation there. You had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And that's how ugly this can get. So absolutely, you are right. There is an impact to this, to you. Oh, absolutely. And it, it within, it, I think, one of the things that, I don't know if it helped or hindered, but at the time, I ended up getting transferred within a year of that incident. So then I went through a complete, utter feeling of loss again, of lo losing that family that I had in my first detachment. And thinking, where, especially when you're starting to feel at least you're safe with this family, then they take you away and they send you to a new family. Just when I was starting to grapple and come to grips with what had happened to me, it seems like within a very short period of time, it was time to leave that family and move on to a new one. Right. Did this, and the only reason I ask this question is I'm just trying to figure out the, the, the potential damage behind this situation. Did this happen with a coworker, like an equal, or was this with a supervisor? No, it was with a coworker, an equal. An equal? Okay. Um, yeah, and the only reason I ask it is a lot of times people go through this with a supervisor and it can be, I've heard a few particularly damaging uh, stories that happen this way, right? And it can be even more damaging because of the, what's it called again? The, uh, the power imbalance that exists between those two ranks, right? Especially if you're on the, on the lower end. Um, did you, were you able to step forward at all and make a complaint or did you just look at leaving? Oh, I just looked at leaving. There was uh, being a police officer and knowing the statistics on sexual assault and the way that the courts and the way that we look at it, it's your word versus their word. And even, I think, only 4% of all sexual assault cases brought before the courts are successful. It, the numbers are staggering. It's, uh, and I knew that. That's uh, sometimes knowledge is not always power because knowing how this would be looked at in the courts and reflected upon and my, my story versus his story, uh, I knew there would be a very slim chance for a pros uh, prosecution. I have to agree. One of the hardest things I ever had to do uh, before I retired, I was actually teaching at the Ontario Police College. And one of the, se one of the lectures I was asked to do in, in part of our federal policing was on sexual assault, and I couldn't do it. I ended up asking a co-worker, I said, I cannot talk about this in front of recruits. I said, because it'll get too emotional for me. And I had to disclose. I didn't disclose that I was a victim of sexual assault. I just said that uh, there was a reason why I couldn't do it. And I, at first, my excuse was, I've never done this. Do you mind doing it for me so I can watch someone else do it? So the first time I used an excuse that, you know, just I wanted to watch one, you know, watch one, do one, see one kind of thing. And the second time I finally said, look, you know, you've heard the rumors going around about the RCMP. I says, I'm the elephant in the room. I just don't feel like I have the capability of talking about this particular subject to recruits. Absolutely. A massive trigger. Oh, ab Absolutely. You know, uh, the fact that it happened on a training course, that it happened in a hotel room were all triggers for me. And I was in a job where I was required to stay in hotels quite, quite a bit uh, due to the type of work that I did. And of course, that was always a trigger for me after that. I want to come back to that as far as healing and how healing looked for you and how you were eventually able to do that. And you may have to refresh my memory because our memories don't get better with PTSD or age. So we've got this, this double whammy for us. But Absolutely. I want to come back to the Merlot uh, class action lawsuit. Yes. And I'd love to talk specifically about how for many women or men too, I don't know, right? It, it could be sex dependent. It could be not be. I, I don't, I'd never applied for it, so I don't understand it. Um, but I want to look at the aspect of was there accountability? 
was anyone held accountable or was it just an acceptance of yes these things happened and here is a paycheck yeah no sadly yep absolutely sadly it was um, it was the latter basically we got to tell our stories and i named names i had nothing left to lose i was uh I was near the end of my career, so for the first time I felt safe enough that I could talk about uh, with this judge because I figured it took forever for me to even decide to come forward because I didn't want to reopen the wounds. Um, just when you think you're getting to a point, something happens, you get triggered. But this would be ripping off the, the bandage. That would be like taking the scar and cutting it open again and making a new scar. So it took me a lot to even make the decision to come forward. But then my thought was this, this is going to be, a, and it's not our only opportunity. The, the, or, the organization has had many studies in regards to this in the past and with no real true um, changes that we've been looking for, changes in policies and procedures uh, is what's required and legislative changes is required. Um, at the end of the day, I felt it was my duty to come forward to help those who are there and for the future women that may have issues that, uh, so that to come forward and just to say my piece, name the names. The sad part was, is that the judge who was absolutely phenomenal basically said, I've heard some of these names before. And that in itself was devastating because you knew that somebody else had already come forward and said something very similar to your story. And that that's what I felt was devastating, Nate, was that there was no accountability. No one was held to, to, to task, even though names were named, people were identified. The whole point of the class action lawsuit was for us to say what we needed to say. Here's your paycheck. Here's your check. Get over it. And of course, for me, I, did, I didn't do it for the money. I did it for uh, my own sense of right and wrong, and finally to tell my story and part of my healing. I considered this to be part of my healing process, to finally say it all and to have someone want to listen to my story. The courage it takes to tell your story is one thing, but to be able to actually do it and in a space where you can be heard so that you can tell your whole story and get everything out, all of the pain and open up those wounds, you no doubt had to open up those wounds to be able to tell your story. I, I again, I, 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 pl I applaud you, Paulette. Um, it, it's an incredibly hard thing to do and you did it for all of the right reasons. Yes. Like I say, it's, um, the, this Marlowe report was the 16th ever report written about issues of women or these particular issues in policing. Someday there'll be a 17th report, maybe an 18th report. Uh, we're slow to, I call this like the Titanic. The RCMP has good intentions, but it sees the iceberg and still can't turn that boat fast enough to miss it even though they see it coming. And time after time, we hit the iceberg again. It's not for ill intent. I think the RCMP wants to improve. I just don't know if they're knowing how to improve it. I think too the issue, I mean, and we're getting philosophical at this point, is the organization is just so embroiled in history and culture and the way they've been doing it for so many years has just been the way that they've been used to pushing forward. And even my own perception of, of how they view it, if we're going to use the analogy of the ship, is definitely certainly at times the Mounties don't even try to steer away from an issue. They just smash through it. Yeah, that's... And they just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And you really need to stop the ship in order to change direction almost at this point, right? So I I do believe I have met with, some, because of this project, I have met with some of the higher ups and have had some discussions in the way they're handling, you know, the mental health of their people and all of these different aspects. And while I believe their hearts are there, 
I don't know if it's possible to really shift that much change efficiently or quickly or in any kind of short time frame we've all been screaming for this stuff for so long and the proof is in the pudding like how long did it take us to get our carbines the merlo davidson class action lawsuit the next class action lawsuit that's coming out that's over a billion dollars for post-traumatic stress that one's working its way through the channels right now when does it end it probably won't no and I think you make a great point. The boat has to stop. But when do you stop? This is a wheel that's difficult to stop. It, in some ways, it needs to keep turning because we the, just the, the type of work that we do. We all just can't stop. But I, I agree with you. I just don't see, uh, I don't see the big wheel turning. It's even hard to slow it down sometimes. And you know what, I'll, I'll join on that uh, when that bandwagon with you as well, and I'll agree with you. I mean, ideally and phys- philosophically speaking, it would be nice to see the ship stop and just r- completely reboot. But you're right, it's never going to happen. That wheel will continue to turn. It needs to. It's just the only thing you can do in this environment is look after yourself. Keep yourself healthy. Have these conversations. Listen to these conversations, figure out where you fit in the world of your own post-traumatic stress and where it's all coming in and, and how it's hitting the dam and, and where your weak spots are and where, where do you need to go to get the help that you mm-hmm. need. You have to have an incredible amount of awareness as a first responder in order to be able to stay mentally well. Yes. And I think the key to healing is knowing that you're not alone. So when, when uh, the judge said, I've heard this name before, that as much as you're in shock, you also thought, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I'm not the only one. Um, and I think that that's why it's so important. And these podcasts are so important to me is because uh, there are people out there who will listen to this and finally say, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one. I thought this was only happening to me. And we get in that headspace when we have PTSD that you are thinking you're alone. You feel alone. We suffer alone. Absolutely. And until until that moment comes where you have the power to bring it forward and to talk about it, and that's what, what I would say was my saving grace. I finally found a good psychologist who was willing to listen to what I had to say, wasn't judgmental. I was blessed because she had lots of experience with the RCMP, so she had that inside knowledge of the way the organization worked. So that was a benefit to me. So I didn't have to always explain what I meant every time I spoke about something with the RCMP. So having had that knowledge of the force made it easier for me to talk without having to always explain every little detail. Absolutely. We need somebody that can speak our language, can understand the way we're speaking, because we have a certain way we speak in the organization. We go through some very unique experiences, but they come out a certain way too. And that needs to be understood. I I found too, even for my own story, that some of my best success with uh, in the psychology appointments came from psychologists that had worked with many, many police officers. And they just knew. Yes. They just knew what was really going on. Absolutely. Right? You can't, you can't hide from those people because you can kind of hide from a psychologist that maybe is just starting to work with police officers, right? Because we get to be very, very good uh, at manipulation and wearing masks and you know playing a, a role in order to appear good and hide from our own pain because it's buried so, buried so deep after you go through this sexual assault paulette what year was this in? 1980 1992 what happens from there well like i said i was transferred uh, in 1993 to a new detachment um so it was kind of like i say uh basically going through the separation of another family, your RCMP family at one detachment, and starting anew with a new one. Um, at, my hopes was when I got to the new detachment that that would be the end of my undercover work. Uh, unfortunately, that turned out not to be so true. The reason why I was, re- I was sent to that detachment was because they were in the need of a female undercover operator. And my first job when I got there was actually to do a job on a on what was potentially a, a dirty police officer from another police force. 
So I ended up doing that job, which kept me out of the detachment, kept me back in the undercover role. Um, but then I got to work with a lot of regional police officers, which was quite unique and a different different mentality, different type of uh, policies and procedures that they go through. But uh, it was kind of a little bit of a break to deal with somebody outside the RCMP. As far as the trauma goes, we're just starting to have some issues with the internet right now. Um, but as far as trauma goes, were there any other significant uh, points in your career where you experienced trauma? Absolutely. When I got to my second detachment, uh, basically, that's when I had an issue with a supervisor who decided that he wanted to have a sexual relationship, um, which I was not uh, interested in. And he always put a lot of pressure on me, uh, always wanted me to drive with him. He was the one that had signed the cars and who would drive with who. And I was getting a lot of heat from the co-workers. He says, how come you're always riding with the boss? And it was it was something that was totally beyond my control. I was not the one that was uh, making these decisions, but I was getting some you know, heat from some of my co-workers that thought I was brown-nosing the boss. And then the whole time I was trying to avoid being with him because he was always wanting to hint at having a sexual relationship. Out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah, this theme that happens in the Mounties. I mean, this and this happens in first responder world and work, uh, I'm assuming quite a bit, unfortunately, even just to, I, I'll, I'll pick, actually, I'll pick your brain on this, this, this issue with sex, I think is something that for, for me, now that I look at, uh, for the men and women that get to a point with PTSD where they're not doing well anymore, and they have been adrenaline junkies for so long, now start to pursue that adrenaline dump through different forms, different behavioral acts, whatever the case is. And I think sometimes for a lot of them, sex becomes something that, you know, risky sex becomes something kind of alluring. That could very well be. It, it didn't happen for me in that particular case. If anything, I, it turned the other way. I was trying to avoid it and stay away from it. After the assault, I was like, I I need a break from people, and I don't want to be in any relationships. I, I if anything, it 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 enclosed my world even more because I just locked myself away. But uh, for me, it was more of, a, of an avoidance than it was the other way around. Now, this obviously, this I think this event probably gets shut down. I'm guessing. Absolutely. I mean, uh, eventually time goes on, and I, I deal with my supervisor who wanting to have you know uh, his advances. I I keep shutting him down, keep shutting him down. And eventually, he gets transferred, and that's the end of that situation. Uh, it came to an end when he was transferred to another unit. Then for a long time, things seemed to be okay. The work was good. There were no more issues with uh, the supervisor I had to deal with. And I just got on with life. Life uh, seemed to go on pretty good there for a little while. What happens next? Um, then I get transferred to a job where I'm in hotels all the time. It almost felt like I was thrown right back into the undercover stuff again, even though the job was... Uh, it was um, a training position in which I needed to go from uh, basically detachment to detachment throughout the province of Ontario. Um, but it was the, it was dealing with you know the dealing with the triggers that uh, of deal going into hotels, being alone again, like just when you get settled into your life again, something comes along and you're back on that same roller coaster of being on the road, being in a hotel and being alone. And those things trigger trigger things again and bring those things back. You were uh, you were essentially running from a problem in your past, and the triggers were there. And being in a constant state of fight or flight continuously, twenty four seven. I mean, this is very important because you're painting this picture of the way your world looks. Where does where does the journey go from there? Um, believe it or not, it. it it takes a little bit of time. About seven at seventeen years of service, I got transferred to Ottawa. Um, that's when things really started to change for me. Um, once again, living in a hotel, total isolation, 
uh, going to work, you look forward to talking to your coworkers, but at the end of the day, you were back into a hotel. And I ended up living in a hotel there for about four months on a project that I was working on for a headquarters in Ottawa. The problem was is that the coworker that uh, had assaulted me was in Ottawa. So all of a sudden now there was some risk. Do you want to talk about uh, hyper village? I was driving, going home, walking in circles, driving around in circles, making sure nobody was following me. Like you get to the point where you almost get paranoid. You're afraid, um, you know, and you did that a little bit as an undercover operator too. You, so you go back into that whole thing of, okay, who's following me? Is there somebody who knows where I am? Um, am I safe? So it was uh, right back full-fledged into the fight-or-flight mode. I don't think there's I don't I don't think there's many healthy versions of paranoia. Um, so we're going to call it what it is. I mean, I think for for just the sense of this conversation, that was a very unhealthy form of paranoia, but also something that the body was trying to use in order to keep you safe, so you didn't re-experience the pain from the past, right? So I, I actually quite get it. Uh, and this is the way our world works too. I don't remember how many, or I can remember how many times I like coming home from work uh, as a drug investigator. And I won't say who we were investigating, but these were not nice people. So when you were coming home, you took a very different route coming home every time. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, it was one thing when you were doing street level enforcement. It, and most of the time, those were the most dangerous people that you dealt with. They had nothing to lose. Uh, but, I mean, when we started uh, doing work with organized crime groups, traditional org organized crime groups, and you, and you knew that there was a possibility or a risk of uh, grievous bodily harm or death, these people meant business. And they, had not, they, they were willing to take those steps to protect their, their livelihoods. They view life entirely different. Uh, absolutely. It's... Uh, it's in, in hindsight, Nate, I would say, and, and I never wanted to do plain clothes duties. I just made the best of it as I went through. I, I would say that that was uh, starting off one of the worst things that could ever happen because, I mean, when I left Depot, I was so proud and I wanted everyone to know I was a Mountie, and yet I was told I couldn't tell anyone. So my whole life was a big fat secret. And I used to jokingly say to people, I get paid to lie to people. But I mean, when you get to the point where you're driving home in circles, your your world's turned upside down. You're always hyper vigilant. You never know when to shut it off. You get home, you can't sleep. Your brain's going 100 miles an hour. You know, did I make it home okay? Did anyone see me? It's 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 not a life, and it it definitely took its toll. And it got to the point where I finally had to reach out for help because I just I knew I just couldn't take it anymore. When do you reach out for help? Probably, and I think it was about 2006 is when I finally reached out. And it was a coworker of mine who saw that I was struggling and said, you need to get some help. Here's the name of a psychologist. And of course, I kept that name and number in my wallet for over a year before I finally had the guts to call. Our first meeting was... We, we, all, we all do it that way. Yeah, isn't that the truth? At uh, my first meeting, I don't think I was able to say my name, and I literally took an hour of her time, and I cried for an hour. It just all came out. It it was just devastating for me. It was, you know, the how hard it was to reach out for help was was still to this day how shocking it it is and how difficult it was. Um, in hindsight, the best thing I ever did. It saved. She saved my life. Yeah, absolutely. What were some of the things that your coworker saw in you that pushed her to finally comment? You know, I I just think she saw that the, the happy-go-lucky Paulette wasn't there as much as it had been in the past. I was starting to uh, be almost antisocial at work, you know, staying away from certain people or issues or just, you know, I, she knew me as a gargarious outgoing person and all of a sudden she saw me as a, an introvert she says this just isn't you there's something wrong and she knew some of the things that some of the type of work that I had been involved with 
at one point I was uh, teaching ethics to uh, to the RCMP, and boy, you want to talk about a difficult lecture because everybody knows right from wrong, and the last people you need to lecture to about ethics are policemen, <laughs> and that that was a difficult uh, go around to say the least. So I'm I'm not even going to touch that one with a ten foot pole. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was hard. It was a, one of the hardest things I ever had to do. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, she knew me from uh, almost from depot, and just knew that the Paulette bro that she knew was not there anymore. So, two thousand and six, you first reach out to get help. Yes. Or sorry, you were told to go and get help, and it took you a year to go and get help, roughly around yes. 2006, 2007. Now, you weren't actually diagnosed with PTSD out until 2012. Yes, that's right. Um, once again, we we keep our mask on because it takes a while to learn to trust. And as much as uh, she had been... She had worked for the RCMP in the past, so it took me a long time to get over that. Um, you, When you want to go and talk to someone, you want to feel that it's going to be confidential and that it won't get back to people. And it took a long time for me to build that trust. That also is very normal. I had significant trust issues, significant. And still to this day, there are many times, even now, even in retirement, when I go and go about my life where I actually have to challenge myself in that initial moment, say with a new person or a person where I am questioning the trust between that person and say, don't this, you're not a police officer anymore. You can trust people. Yeah, I know. And it, and like you say, that's one of the things that uh, I agree with too. I've been out of the organization now for five years and uh, the first few years were, were challenging to say the least were to put, you know, put your guard down, which is so hard to do, to get out of the hyper vigilance. You know, it's you're still looking. Is someone still out there? Is someone still following me? Is someone from my past coming to get me? Is this really over? And it takes a while to get out of that. I don't know if you ever stop being hyper vigilant, but at least you can get to a place where it seems that you can still have a normal bit of life. Absolutely. Like I don't, I don't think for me, my hypervigilance is something that'll ever be gone, but I know how to kind of work it now where, you know, it's not at the level where I was as a civilian, but it's, it's a little bit less pronounced now and it's not as much there, but these, and these are all very normal things the body does in order to try and keep you safe. So when we talk about these things, it's not like they're necessarily bad things, but to the degree that they become uh, enforced within us because of our training and our experiences, they do become unhealthy traits about us because we can't navigate life anymore in a healthy fashion because of these these cyclical thoughts, the insomnia, the hypervigilance, always being in this state of uh, fight or flight, the paranoia, the trust issues, the mood swings, the behavioral issues. Uh, it just goes on and on and on, right? And this is just the cost of service life. Now, eventually, once you get to a place where you, Paulette, are recognizing that these are actually hurting you now, these traits that are actually being used to try and keep you safe, you eventually do get diagnosed in 2012. And what was that like? It, I think I've got to take a little step back first, Nate, because one of the things that I failed to bring up and I'm going to bring up is that I was struggling with an alcohol uh, problem. I was drinking to deal with some of these issues. And I was, I think, for the most part, a functional a functioning alcoholic, I think I became, as much as um, I truly believe that I was at that point, the drinking had gotten so bad. It started off harmlessly enough, but it got to the point where uh, on Sunday night, knowing I had to go to work on Monday, it needed a drink. Then it needed two drinks. Then it needed more than two drinks. And it got to the point when I, when I, went to Ottawa and back into that hotel life and hypervigilance, the drinking became 
a problem. So um, that when when I did finally get diagnosed with PTSD, um, it was somewhat of a relief to know that there were, I could finally give it a name, what, would it, what was happening to me, and somewhat of a shock, but I guess I knew, I always knew something was wrong, and the drinking was trying, I think, I got to the point where it took me a long time to even admit to my psychologist how much I was drinking. There's no shame in that. Like you say, I never lost a day of work. I was never called in sick. I never missed a day. I never missed any time. But it really was a problem. And it was how I dealt with <clears throat> my hypervigilance and my uh, PTSD. And um, it took a long time for us to... Uh, to work on that part of it and to overcome that addiction to the alcohol that I had formed. How do you look at it now, uh, addiction, the topic of addiction? I'm so much more sympathetic now because now I understand it that much better. Having been in a situation where um, I was using it to numb my feelings and now I can understand, I guess I have more sympathy for a heroin addict because they're trying to numb their feelings right that's what the heroin does for them and i i i guess in some ways i felt well at least i know now what it feels like to be a heroin addict i know how to numb my feelings the, they were just using a different drug to numb theirs oh addiction is one of those topics that you and i could talk for days on uh an addiction is something that i argue now now that i and i faced addiction as well Yes. Openly speak about it. Mm -hmm. And I went to rehab and I, it was one of the best things I did for myself. I eventually found sobriety too, as well. And that's when things finally change. Now, addiction is one of those things that is it heavily rooted in us culturally through cell phones, through pornography, through all of these different issues? Yes. <clears throat> unfortunately a lot of us tend to shy away from the topic of addiction because and i'm not sure why this is <clears throat> but regardless of the fact you and i go into active addiction because of the pain and the suffering that exists with the trauma now you and i both have a really good understanding and i guess acceptance of the topic and i'll even i'll i'll echo this story too about how you now view a heroin addict uh just shortly after finally dealing with my addiction, getting sober and committing to that path. I remember driving by a homeless man out here in Langley and my heart just broke because I looked at him and I said, there is no difference between him and I. There is no difference. I could have been him. Actually, I probably was him other than the, you know, the clothes and the actual physical location in that time. But I was so so consumed in suffering from the job that there was no difference between he and I. And that's when I finally looked at addiction and I finally said, wow, we really need to look at addiction differently yeah, and meet it with the empathy and the sympathy and the compassion that it deserves because there is a lot of human pain and suffering behind addiction. And when we look at it, I think a lot of times we write people off initially and just go, well, that person's an addict. They don't deserve anything. That's, that's not the solution. No, I agree. And, and I still have a hard time. You know, I, I always want to give them a handout, a little bit of money. Um, you know, it's, you, you hate to give them money knowing that it's going to feed their addiction, but I also understand their need, what it feels like to want to numb yourself and to get away from those hurt, hurtful feelings. And I, I just assume now that a lot of people that I look at, I look at it now with a lot more sympathy and understanding. When did you face uh, addiction, Paulette? What years? Um, it, it, it had really started when I went to Ottawa in 2017. That's when it started to get uh, out of hand. I would get home from uh, the job, go to the hotel room. I'd make sure that I had a bottle of uh, alcohol. Usually it was brandy at the time. And uh, then, it, then it became a Mickey. Then it became a, a bigger bottle, then a bigger bottle. And what I would do is I would start to drink as soon as I got home from work until I passed out. 
And then if I woke up at two or three o'clock in the morning, I'd have another drink or two so I could go back to sleep. Wow. And it that was a vicious cycle that had uh, become my world. So I remember when I finally was able to tell my psychologist, she thought I was drinking wine and the whole time I was drinking uh, brandy or whiskey straight, neat, right? almost right out of the bottle. I didn't need to, I didn't want to dilute it. I wanted it to be strong. And I liked hard liquor because it, it, it I, I would get numb quickly. It would numb the pain very fast. So you could almost get the first full shot in and then you could feel, it felt good. And I hate to admit it, but I, it made me feel good. The pain and suffering was that big that anything that takes away that pain and suffering would feel good. That is what addiction is. Addiction yep. is just trying to navigate the immense amount of pain and suffering that we're going through in that moment. So there is no judgment here. I mean, I I very much get why you had to try and end your human suffering. And I mean, we can only do that for so long. We can only stay in pain and suffering for so long. And then eventually something will happen, whether it's active addiction or suicide or or whatever the case is. It's not like you can just stay in that space forever. How long did your active addiction take place, like over how many years, and how did you seek help with that? So one of the things that was very interesting was the the organization by this point had become involved because I had taken some time off from work. I think I took a month off because things had just really hit ahead, and I um, I finally I actually met with health services. And this is going to be, an, 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 it's a long story. I'll try to make it short. Basically, you know how health services, every three years, you got to fill out the form and send it to the doctor and get get your annual uh, pH. What is it? PHA? Yeah, you're, you're right. Anyway. You're right. They, PHA. Yep. So I went and the doctor asked me a question. He says, do you think you have a problem with alcohol? And I finally said, yes. And he says, well, what, you know, what do you think? And so I basically said, yes, I believe I have a problem with alcohol. And he asked me how many drinks I had. And I told him and he wrote it down and he made a notation, I guess, on the form that I never got privileged to see. Um, next thing you know, three years later, same doctor, same form, same time. Do you still have a problem with alcohol? Yes, I do. How many drinks are you drinking? And I told him, he says, I thought I wrote something down at last time for, for them to look into this. Did anyone get in touch with you? I said, no, I've never been in touch with anyone. He said, well, I made a notation on your file. So I ended up doing a freedom a tip request on my medical file because now I'm intrigued. What did he write on my file? Well, unfortunately, he didn't write anything that, was, that got anybody's attention. He basically said I should be keeping an eye on my drinking and, you know, if possible, reduce my drinking. But it wasn't enough to trigger anybody's attention. So when I went off for a month uh, sick, I had to meet with health services to get back to work. And I brought it up to them. I said, well, I told you before that I had issues with my drinking and you did nothing about it. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, my PHA for two which was over a six-year period because it was every three years. I said, for six years now, I've said I've had a problem with drinking for the first three on the first form and on the second form, and you've made no no mention or no comment about it because at this point, they wanted to send me to rehab, and I was fighting it. I said, I've been very honest about my drinking from the get-go. I've never missed a day's work. I, and I was making excuses is what I was doing. But I was says, I've never missed a day's work. I've never called in sick. I get my work done. Now you want to send me to rehab? And I was mad. I was mad that the RCMP should have known because I had been so honest about my drinking. And yet it's I slipped through the cracks. And as a result, um, my psychologist at the time uh, supported me because she said leaving home would have made the PTSD just that much worse at the time because my home was my safe place. I got to the point where being home was the safest place for me to be. 
And uh, she concurred with that. And by the grace of good God, Nate, I was able to get the drinking under control. I actually went alcohol free for two full years. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you to do it on your own too. Yeah. Good for you. Yes. Uh, and I felt like I had to, I don't know why I was, um, not that I don't support rehab. I think it's a brilliant thing, but for me at the time, I just was in a place where I thought being at home was the most important place to be. And I had, I had support then too at home. So that uh, was very helpful. It got to a point, Nate, where, um, I would ask my uh, roommate to lock the liquor up, keep it locked away so that I didn't have access to it. Yep. I understand that very well. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that very well. And that comes from not trusting ourselves to avoid that temptation. Absolutely. It doesn't mean I didn't look for the keys. I sure (laughs) did at times. I'll be very honest. As much as I asked them to lock it up, I did look for keys at time from time to time. So it was not an easy uh, rehabilitation to that point, but no. I did finally get there. And now the, the the alcohol in my house is open; it's not locked up anymore, and uh, I can have a social drink now and not not overdo it anymore. I'm I'm able to do that today. There are there are and I mean there are a few people that may listen to this and they might go they might automatically go to a place of how does Paula do it? Maybe she's hiding, maybe she has an addiction still and I'm actually going to step in here and say that for you, I think you've done very well in your recovery and you can go on to lead a life with having a relationship with alcohol and it's healthy. Yes, and there, there are some people that can never go back to that place. There are some people that can. Yep. Um, and we don't get to judge one another for the way that we choose to do life after addiction. You, you have done the work. I truly believe it. I'm very interested too why you actually didn't go to rehab. And it's almost like my mind automatically goes to, you know, because of everything that you had been through, maybe you just only trusted one place and that was home. And that was the only place where you could heal. And and I, I honestly believe that to be true, Nate. Um, it got to the point that after living in hotels and suitcases, you know, the one place I always wanted to be was just to be home. And uh, when I got home from work, you can be sure I locked the door and I stayed there. I was happy never to leave the home. Because I, for so long, that's all I ever wanted to be was home because of the type of work that I did. I was not afforded that option. So I, I did consider my home to be my safe place. It makes so much sense. I mean, even if you think about having to go to rehab, rehab could have been a major trigger for you. It could have reinforced this idea that you were just continually on the road, not in your safe place. Could you have healed? Yeah, I know. I think you actually, this makes total sense to me. Like, and like you say, it, until you live the type of uh, gypsy life that I led, right? From doing the undercover from town to town to town to then going to another job that took you... F- on the road, in suitcases, in hotels, uh, after, and that was probably about 13 years of my service of living in a job in which I was never really home, uh, believe me. And then I was home for a couple of years and life was getting better. And then I took another job that took me on the road. So home is definitely my safe place. Your story well into, I mean, being diagnosed with 2012 then then ushers in this chapter of now trying to understand what does your PTSD look like? I'm sure you very much went through this chapter as well, and it takes us time. I was diagnosed in 2014, and it took me a very, very long time to truly see my PTSD and really understand it. You retired in 2017, right around the time when active addiction was now kind of knocking on your door. Now, you were able to heal from active addiction and move on, but can we talk about your retirement and what retirement looked like for you? Absolutely. Um, So just before I went on, uh, just before I retired, I was on medical leave. So um, the first thing I decided to do was I knew that I just couldn't, even though home was my safe place, I needed to do something, 
but I wanted to work with, I ended up, I decided I wanted to work with animals. I've never met an animal yet that hurt me. And I felt that this was a way of not dealing with people. I still wasn't ready to deal with people. So I ended up volunteering on a horse farm for a year. Horses are the most amazing animals. Um, I felt uh, at peace with them. Uh, some people were afraid of them. I wasn't. They were, uh, that was my, my kind of my way of healing, to get away from people and to deal with something that was not, it was something that I'd never done before. So it was something new. Uh, it was very therapeutic to deal with these animals. And uh, so that's what I decided to do. Equestrian, did I say that right? Equestrian? Yes. Equestrian? Equestrian therapy. Uh, my daughter's riding right now with horses and I absolutely love it. And I never got to go through equestrian therapy. I have heard some amazing things about it. And just to connect the dots here as to why it's such a good therapy for someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder is it really helps us ground in the moment because a horse is a very emotional animal and a horse can read you in your own state of emotions. And you have to be very careful around horses with your emotions in that moment because they'll either like you or they won't. So you really have to check in with yourself when you're around a horse to be engaged and to be grounded. And it brings us to the present moment because a lot of times with PTSD, we either live in the past or the future. We're either riddled by those two those two scenarios, right? And that's the brain's way of trying to figure out, okay, where are the threats? You know, how do we keep ourselves safe? And we don't really become good anymore at living in the present moment. So for us to go and do something like this, absolutely, that makes great sense. Uh, I'm glad that you got to experience that. It sounds like it definitely helped you and it kind of started to show you how to heal. Absolutely. And with that, as much as I say I wanted to avoid people, eventually with horses there are people <laughs> and and that was a good way to first what i would do is is uh, work at volunteer in the daytime when nobody was there then i only got to deal with the horses then by doing that i ended up staying a little bit later and doing the turnouts which means bringing the hor or turn ins bringing the horses in feeding them and then dealing with some of the students that were coming for horse riding lessons and then dealing with younger kids which was such, they're, I, they're so therapeutic. Kids are absolutely wonderful. And uh, these young kids would look up to you, right, to help them, to help them put the saddle on, to help them brush their horse. And that in itself became very therapeutic, dealing with the young kids that looked up to you. And it made you feel good again. Social isolation is a very unhealthy part of PTSD that happens to us as well. But much like you highlighted, there's this need to, for some of us, we can't just jump back into having relationships with people. We kind of have to test the waters. We've got to have relationships with an animal first, right? Maybe it's a therapy dog or a horse or whatever the case is. But however you did your recovery, I mean, that's totally up to you. As long as you did it in a way that it's good and healthy for you, it eventually unlocked the door for you to be able to now start to re-experience people and see that they're truly worth trusting and they're okay to be around. They're not a threat. That's right. And it's really funny, Nate, because just when you were getting comfortable to being around people, then the pandemic hit <laughs> and isolation came all over again. Oh God, um, that pandemic. That's when I relapsed. Exactly. It, it, right? Social isolation. Exactly. It, all of a sudden, you know, um, and I'll be lying if I didn't say at times I, I appreciated social isolation again. And the pandemic gave me an excuse. Sometimes you're tired of making up excuses for why you don't want to go and visit people. And eventually people get tired of calling you. But the pandemic I was at first, the first year was bad. Um, but now um, I'm good again. Like I've made it through the pandemic. I've actually been on a couple of cruises. I've gone traveling. Good for you. Started to travel again and uh, I'm good again. I'm feeling great. It's a, awesome. That's awesome to hear. It, it It's really been, like you say, a complete 180. I, I'm happy again. I'm loving life. I'm enjoying me, being with people again. And that, that hasn't happened for me in a long, long time. So I, I'm in a really, really good place right now.
everything that's happened to you in your life. I mean, there's, we just talked for an hour and a half about some really hard things, some really hard challenges that you faced in your life. And then now all of a sudden, and I, this is where I love to leave off in the conversation is you, if, is, is there any part of your story that you want to talk about, but before we start to move into like post-traumatic growth? I think I've, like I say, I've, I've told you some, I've told you all of the things that led me to that dark place, that post-traumatic stress, but, uh, I think I'm good. I think we've covered everything off pretty well. Post-traumatic growth. Now, and we didn't even really talk about this. The Merlot Davidson class action lawsuit, I think happened in 2017. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, 2016, I believe you're right. 2016, 2017. Right. So you obviously had to go through a lot there. And that probably started to this ability to heal because now you're really starting to get your story out. It's not just with the psychologist, but it's now in a court. And then you go on to write a book. And when did the book come out? Uh, the book came out in 2019. And I love the name, Never at Ease. Yes. Perfect. Yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Yeah, I think, and, and that's really that's really what PTSD is. Really, abs- absolutely, and I, I talk even and talked in there about my su- suicidal thoughts and my suicidal I, you know, I, I, ideation. That's right, and so I put it all out there. And the book, believe it or not, was the it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but the best thing I ever did. Yeah, absolutely. M- much like my season one. My season one was my book. Yes. Just getting out and telling my story. And you too. Your book is, it, it's such a therapeutic thing to finally be able to step out and say, here's my story. And very interesting too, that we choose to do this because I know even for, for me, I couldn't sit down and tell my mom and dad. No. Season one. I, I had to come out and do it through a podcast to get it out. A very indirect way of kind of approaching the topic, but finally being able to have you know, an ability to get it out. So, and I don't, do you kind of see it that way for yourself as well with the book? Absolutely. That was how I was able to tell my family and friends what had happened to me. I mean, they could probably, and I'd be lying to say they didn't see some of the character changes, the mood swings, the anger. I was having outbursts of anger and I'm sure they probably thought, what the world is wrong with her? And I know that a lot of people after they read the book say, Paulette, I, I get it. I, I understand now why you acted the way you did. Absolutely. I actually heard this comment from a friend. They had uh, messaged me indirectly and said, wow, I understand Nathan so much more now. You know, and you wish that you had the courage or the strength, the ability to have brought it out sooner but I mean, it just, I think when you understand PTSD, you understand that it, everybody takes their own time to bring their story out and the ways that they bring their story out. Like you say, for me, the writing was very hard, but very therapeutic. And it just seemed like I took the black cloud off the top of my head, kind of blew it away when I came out with the book. Healing. Yeah. That's what healing looks like. You're finally able to deal with all of these years of trauma, the layers of the onion that have layered up over and over and over. Uh, and it's and very similar. I'm sure a lot of people are going to pick up on the fact that you suppress things for many, many years. But now to go back to the childhood uh, experience that also was a, a sexual assault, how... How do you look at that now, having had gone through PTSD, and how did you approach healing with PTSD and the past, some of the past trauma that you experienced as a child? Well, there was no doubt um, when I, and it was interesting because my psychologist gave me a book to follow uh, on on our journey of getting well, and I don't know if the book was necessary about PTSD, but maybe about depression, or and part of the chapters of the book was actually about your youth. So she forced me to confront what had happened in the past uh, by going through this book and following the chapters and having to do homework and report back to her. And uh, so that helped to deal with the the things that happened in my childhood. 
because she she made it a point to bring to to do this by following this book. And I'd have to look it up, Nate, but I really think it was something like Depression for Dummies, or it was something like that. But uh, by by her forcing me to go through the chapters and being accountable to her by having to show her my homework helped me to bring those things forward. And then how did that impact your healing with PTSD later on? Um, that's a good question. You know, so much had happened and, and sadly, it felt like a repeat of what had happened in my youth, right? I had had to deal with uh, sexual um, issues in my childhood. And then, of course, again, later in life, having to deal with the sexual assault again, um, brought the two together. It brings it, it brings it like back. Um, it, it was not, it wasn't easy um, to have to deal with the young. The, the problem, I guess the good thing that came out is once again, my, my mom was there when I was younger. So I was blessed to have her, I could talk to about it. And so that made it easier in the time frame where when I was sexually assaulted uh, on the job, it was, uh, I had no one to talk to about it. Yeah. And it's so complex, right? Like I know when I walked into rehab and the therapist that I was sitting down with at the time, uh, cause I very much had this belief when I walked into rehab that I was going to walk in and I was going to deal with the trauma from policing. And they said, well, you're actually also here to deal with your childhood trauma. And I was like, no, I don't really have that. So I, again, denial, we had to work on that. And then eventually, once I finally saw my childhood trauma, I then went, oh, so we actually have to start all the way back there first in order to heal the PTSD on the back end too. And it's almost like this weird long piece of yarn that gets all messed up over the course of our lifetime, right? And gets wrapped up and torn and twisted and in knots. And you don't actually get to deal with your PTSD as an adult. You have to go all the way back to the beginning and start to heal there and then bring the healing through your life, if that makes sense. Did you find that kind of happened for yourself absolutely like you say uh, and i i can see where my childhood was affected by what had happened but i i can completely agree that i had to go back and face what had happened back then and deal with those issues before i could move on to it's almost like you're I like your analogy of untying the knots and untangling the wool, but it needs to be done. If you really want to get better and, and, and heal, you have to, un, it's like an onion. You got to p- peel it right to the end. Cause I think to a lot of people that I, that I've connected with that are just starting to understand their PTSD and they all, they all say this cause we all do, we all look at our PTSD and we go, okay, we're just going to heal from the trauma that's happened to us as an adult. And it actually goes deeper than that. Yeah. It goes much, much deeper than that. It usually, I believe, 100% of the time goes back to the childhood. And only when you can go back to the childhood and forgive yourself and give yourself the self-compassion that you deserve and deal with the shame and the guilt that happened in those very young forming year, habit forming years, can you truly start to then heal on later as well. So you, it, it's very tricky, but when done, I mean, and you're, you're very much a case, a perfect example of where you've taken this. You've now gotten to a place where you've gone through some very significant things in your life, but you're healing and you're on that post-traumatic growth journey. There's a lot of people that don't make it out of even just post-traumatic stress, Paulette, but you've managed to do it. No, uh, uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I consider myself to be very lucky, very blessed that uh, I'm in a, in the position that I am today. I, I, I'll be honest with you, there were times I never thought I'd ever see this day. I'm to the point where my psychologist finally, <laughs> God bless her, she's a wonderful lady, but she said, it's time for you to let me go. And I was afraid to do that. I must admit, I was very fearful of not going to see my psychologist because I thought, well, what happens? Who who will I t- talk to? 
Well, then I ended up finding other people in my life that I could talk to. But the fear of letting go of the help that got me where I am was was very scary. And yet I, I still stay in touch with her. Uh, I still send her the odd email. because, And I think as long as I can, I will do that. But now we talk about fun things and we talk about travel and we talk about adventures you know that you do when you're on your on your on your travels where I'm not talking about how much I had to drink anymore and I'm not talking about you know thinking about suicide I'm 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 just in such a good place that uh, it's nice to be able to almost like I say talk about normal things You know you're doing well in PTSD when you can feel the good emotions again, the positive ones. And I'm actually starting to shed a tear because I'm extremely proud of you for getting to that place. And I know how hard it is to get to that place. Yes, like I say, and I'm, I like I say, I'm blessed that I have gotten to this place, and I know how hard it was and how long it took me to get here. It's a it's a long journey and not a simple one, but boy. Uh, I'm like I say, I'm to the point where I'm now uh, lecturing again about the RCMP and proud to do so. Uh, where my red surge, I feel proud to be in it again. It's uh, it's just such a good good place to be. Amazing, and that right there is post traumatic growth. It doesn't have to get any better than that. That is the right place to be. Where you go from here is entirely up to you. But it sounds like you're definitely on the right course. You're doing the cruise ships. You're seeing the people. You're not running from them anymore. Uh, you've learned how to kind of self assess yourself by the sounds of it too, and even check in and kind of see the little micro dips that we have because we still dip. Even in this journey, we still have our hard moments or months, right, where we regress a little bit. Uh, But one of the things that I really wanted to kind of just come back to is, one, thank you for your service and your sacrifice. You shine through on this interview, Paulette. Like the real you, the beautiful you, I just wanted to say thank you for being here and being real. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for providing the opportunity and thank you for what you're doing. I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing. And the people you're reaching is, 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 is you don't even know the people that you're reaching and the, and the good that you're doing. So thank you. You're welcome. Another tough thing for us PTSD survivors is learning how to accept compliments. Yes. Very, very hard after a year of, or, or a lifetime of service. The one thing to kind of wrap this this beautiful interaction up and tie it off with a bow is what what is that one thing for you, Paulette, that you would love to just give to everyone from your journey? What is that one piece of advice or that one piece of reflection that you have that you would love to give? I'm going to say this. I have tried to help people along their journey by letting them read a book by Dr. Uh, Gil Martin, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. The problem is I gave it to them when they were just going into policing. And I read the book when I was just getting into policing, and it was too soon. What I'd love to do is get people to read it, and then 10 years from now, get them to read it again. Because that's when you understand. It takes time and it takes experience before you get it. And uh, there's like these wonderful self-help books for police, but you need to be ready for it. You need to go through the experiences and feel some of the traumas before you understand what what they are. And the other thing I would say is talk. Oh my God, please talk. Talk to someone always talk about what's going on in your life, in your work, uh, the traumas that you're dealing with. You need someone that you can really trust and talk to about them, who who isn't going to judge you, who just wants to be there for you and listen. We have a problem in Canadian society, or society as whole, I say, is that we listen to respond. We don't listen to understand. And if you can find someone who will listen to understand you, Never let them go. Hang on to them for as long as you can. Right. So most of the time when you're talking to someone, our human brain is the most amazing computer ever 
made on this earth. There's no computer better. And when someone talks to you, the minute they say something, you instantly come up with a response. Instantly you have something you want to say. And sometimes we're bad and we'll cut somebody off because we want to say it to them right away before we forget. Oh my gosh, let me tell you this. Or you're telling me a story. Oh, well, let me tell you my story. Instead of listening to understand by letting you tell your story and just listening to it, we have a tendency to listen to respond, which is wrong. We need to listen to understand. You've taught an old dog a new trick, a new saying. So thank you, Paulette. That's one that I'm going to uh, I'm going to remember because of you. So thank you. You're absolutely right in your sentiments about Dr. Gil Martin's book, I Too. And we talked about this just before pressing record, how important it is to read that book at the very beginning of your service life but to read it at multiple phases of your service life, because that book will mean such different things as you walk the journey of your life. Paulette, it's, it's been an absolute honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And once again, uh, thank you. You are very welcome. We'll end it off here. Much love to all of our listeners. Everyone, this is Paulette Bro. She has a phenomenal book. I will make sure that when this episode comes out, the book is built into the Instagram post and all of the social media posts so you can easily just buy it and help support her. I'm sure she would appreciate that. And Paulette, once again, thank you for your service and your sacrifice, but more importantly, being able to come back to a place where you can tell us exactly what it all looked like. Oh, thank Thank you. Thank you for joining us on season two. If you are a first responder with an incredible story into post-traumatic stress, please reach out and connect with myself. Season two is based on your story. And if you want to step up to the plate and share your story with the world, I would be more than honored to help you do that. Thank you for your continued support with this project. And thank you for tuning in today.